podcast from Peach 2020, hosted by Peter Martin. Hello, I'm Peter Martin, founder of Peach 2020, the international network for senior executives, entrepreneurs and influencers from across the hospitality sector. And welcome to the first in our new series of Top Table podcasts, which will see me in conversation with some of the biggest names in the out-of-home food and drink business, the real movers and shakers, picking up the issues shaping the future of our industry. And one of the biggest concerns right now is the future shape, strength and resilience of the supply chain, that network of food and drink producers and suppliers that keep our pubs, bars and restaurants stocked and able to trade. The challenges facing suppliers are very much the same as for operators and some. Inflation, energy costs, people, legislation, sustainability, climate change, Brexit, I could go on. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome the leader of one of the most important cogs, if not the most important cog in the UK's food service supply chain. That's Andrew Selly, CEO of Bidfood. Andrew, welcome to Top Table. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure to be here. Tell me, well, we are emerging, we all hope, from the pandemic. And I suppose the big question is, is what shape is the supply chain in? And more importantly for you and for us is what shape is bid food in? How strong are you? How resilient are you? I think... If you're asking me, asking me today, then we're, we're in good shape. I think the, the last 18 months, two years, has obviously been very challenging. And I think specifically from a supply chain perspective, the last 12 months has been more challenging than the rest of it put together. Obviously, we sort of had the emergence from um, lockdown three um, around Easter last time. And certainly, I think the recovery of the, of the whole hospitality industry took all of us, I think, to a certain extent, but by surprise, you know, demand was pretty quickly back to pre-pandemic levels, and the supply chain, yeah, in total, um, struggled to catch up. Whether that be manufacturing, you know, shipping of commodities around the world, availability of um, staff for our customers, availability of staff for us, availability of staff for our suppliers, I think, you know. Uh, up and down the supply chain, we saw a lot of stress and a lot of strain um, and quite a bit of disruption. I think over the last month, things have improved. Um, I'm sure we'll go into some detail later on, but certainly I think it's stabilised. And I think if I look at our readiness for what we hope again in the first half of this year is a return back to pre-pandemic um, volumes, then from a bid food perspective, we're very confident that we are you know, well placed, we're well resourced, um, our suppliers are better resourced, and uh, we think it will be a, a strong um, half, first half to 2022. Because, of course, you're, you, you don't just supply, as you were, hospitality, you, 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 you cover the whole waterfront, as it were, public sector, hospitals, um, schools, prisons, whatever, you know, you've got a broad sense. So, You've got a lot of different pressures. I'm interested. You're saying that you know, did you were saying that the the resurgence of hospitality, in the sense, took you a bit by surprise. I mean, how how are you planning this time for 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 coming back? Are you you you're thinking everything is going to come back pretty quickly? Well, I think obviously last this time last year we were in a lot of conversations with all of our customers um, who were forecasting where they thought demand would return to. Um, but as I say, I think in sort of May and June and into the summer. Certainly in, you know, sort of leisure, pubs, restaurants, hotels, um, you know, accommodation, theme parks and all those sort of areas, it, it really just came back massively. The one areas or the two areas that really never quite recovered last year to their sort of pre-pandemic levels were unsurprisingly sort of workplace catering and uh, travel, travel catering, um, workplace certainly from our perspective, probably got up to about 75, 80% of um, pre-pandemic levels by November. But then with the Omicron sort of variant coming in and, and, and the government not really locking us down, but sort of advising us all to, uh, to stay at home and be careful and work from home, then we saw workplace drop back again to sort of half of what it was or what it was normally. Yeah. 
So, yeah, as we're sitting here, we're looking forward to, to this year. Then we, again, we envisage workplace being the one that will struggle to return to fully where it was before, because I think even um, when everything opens up, there's obviously clearly a lot of talk about hybrid working and an element of working at home. So we think workplace will probably come back to about 80%. And that is going to have a little bit of a knock on in some city centers to the hospitality industry that rely on um, office workers. Um, but we see everything else, you know, coming back, you know, strongly, we think travel will come back um, to pre pandemic levels. And, and clearly, some areas are, you know, above where they were before. So if you take sort of QSR and some pub um, um, and, and casual dining chains who capitalized on the delivery um, aspect of their business, you know, when the restaurants and, and when they've reopened fully for full service, yeah, you know, delivery hasn't gone away per se. So they've they've got the best of delivery and um, full service again. So obviously some are doing well, and some some areas are still struggling. Yeah, because in one in one sense you are really a good barometer for the health of the health of the broad food service sector because you cover such a a. a, a a widespread of different businesses, and also I suppose it's worth reminding people that you, you know, you work the the breadth of um, breadth of the country. I mean, remind us. I mean, how you know how how big is bid food in 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 real terms? In terms of you know um, number of number of people, number of vehicles, n- number of sites. Well, ac- across bid food, we've got about uh, thirteen hundred vehicles. We've got four and a half thousand people across twenty six sites. So we're offering operating from. Uh, you know, Inverness down to uh, the southwest and southeast of of England in, into Wales. Um, we obviously also have our our fresh business, um, Bid Fresh, with our fresh fruit and veg, fresh fish and fresh meat, which has another sort of nine or ten depots, another fifteen hundred staff. So we're we're covering, as you say, the the length and breadth of the country in in all geographies and all sectors. Yeah, and I mean it, it's interesting. You also picked out you're you're, you're talking about the shape of the, of the market as it comes back, and as if you you said QSR has done pretty well, mainly because it's been able to trade more because of delivery and click and collect etc. Et but obviously, there's a lot of talk, and, and you're pinpointed it here about the return to the office and travel. I mean, e- even now, you know, rail stations and commuter belts are are still pretty pretty empty in terms of their, their car park capacity. Um, there is a lot of talk that it will take till 2030 for perhaps offices to return and flexible workings here. I mean, what are the sort of conversations you're having with those with 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 those clients, you know, the contract caterers? I mean, you've, you've said you're looking to, you're, you're expecting to go back to 80%, but um, are you expecting it to go back to what it was before longer term or, or, or do you, are you reshaping your business to reflect a new reality? Uh, we're not reshaping in, in totality because obviously there's, there's plenty of uh, volume to keep, to keep us busy. I think that the conversations are still evolving. I, mean, I, was, I was meeting with, with a couple of the big contract caterers this week and, and to be honest, they're still having those discussions with, with their clients. I mean, obviously, they generally cover more than just um, – the, the big banks and the big insurance companies, a lot of them are doing, you know, Amazon warehouses or manufacturing facilities, which has obviously been booming um, anyway. Uh, but certainly, and the, their conversations with their customers in, in the big sort of city institutions are um, that at the moment they're treading a little bit gently and encouraging um, staff to come back to work because they've got to be conscious of people's sort of mental health and anxiety, et cetera after you know a significant period of disruption but their their view is that over the next 12 months that 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 will become a little bit more um forceful shall we say in terms of that encouragement to uh, to get back to normal yeah so if we you know as, as we said you you cover you know you're affected by practically everything at the moment but if you were looking at the priority your priorities and presumably you do every day in terms of your board agenda what what what's what is your biggest priority what's your biggest concern certainly in in the short term at the moment i think p- people will still be our our biggest concern and i'm sure it will be our customers and suppliers biggest concern i think we found it easier to um recruit people in the last few months uh, but the key really is is about retention and that will be the same for our customers because obviously the 
recruitment is fine, but then you've got to train in the experience, train in the culture, train in the service attitude. Um, and you can only do that by retaining and developing the staff. So um, that will still remain a challenge because there is still a shortage, especially as you know the well-publicized shortage of HGV drivers. Um, you know, people are still going to be looking to poach people from one company to another. So, yeah, we're doing quite a bit to to promote the, the I think the, the the advantages of being an HGV driver in hospitality because you know people talk about the disadvantage of being a, an HGV driver trucking up and down the motorway and the motorway services and where you get to sleep, etc. But really, for for us delivering to our customers, then you know it's. Monday to Friday, the occasional Saturday, back in your own bed every night and delivering to fantastic um, food and hospitality venues who will probably give you a cup of coffee and may give you some <laughs> breakfast or some lunch. And, but generally, you're dealing with service-orientated people. And it's a very different um, picture than is often painted of, of the HGV driver because predominantly our drivers are customer service ambassadors who happen to drive um, rather than drivers who happen to to make deliveries but so for us the focus will still be around people whether they are you know in the warehouse driving or or coming back into the office um for ourselves as well so so how big was the the shortage of drivers you had to put up with and and and, and how's your recruitment gone i think the road haulage association suggested that there was a shortfall of a hundred thousand drivers in the uk in total which ultimately um pushes up demand and pushes up wages which affects us all um from our perspective we as you say because we cover yeah healthcare education prisons defense etc we we were still quite busy during um lockdown etc so we retained you know a lot of our drivers but i think the indication um is that yeah last this time last year we probably had a shortfall of about 200 drivers and to get that's 200 drivers we've probably had to recruit 600 because we've had a churn of uh of 400 who've moved on so it's certainly been a fluid year yeah um yeah. but like i say i think the last couple of months has given us that stability just to, to bed people in make sure they're properly inducted and in a better place i mean what have you had to do i mean you talk about retention what have you had to do to actually attract those people has your your wage bill gone up in terms and conditions changed i mean you know Oh, massively. I mean, we're, in terms of conditions, yeah, we can't we can't really change. But as I say, for for from a driving perspective, they're they're relatively attractive. But our wages have gone up thirty percent for for drivers, and obviously that knocks on into uh, into other parts of the business. So, yeah, that's a yeah, and also the the cost of agency drivers. If you want agency drivers for for, for specific sort of peaks in demand, cost of agency drivers has probably gone up forty percent. Um, so, you know, it has been a, you know, a big um, change in that cost dynamic. And obviously, you know, once that's in, it's not going to go away. Once it's in people's wages, it's, it's there to stay. Because obviously the concern from the operator's point of view is how much of that cost is going to be, going to be passed on to them. Because obviously we are in an inflationary situation on, in all sorts of levels at the moment. Um, how, are you, how are you handling that? Well, we do. We we have done, and we continue to do quite a lot of work to to mitigate those costs. I mean, obviously, we it's obviously not just about the driver cost. We, well, I'm sure we might talk about food costs later. Yeah, food costs, utility costs, yeah. packaging costs. <laughs> yeah, where, wherever you look, <laughs> yeah. um, th- those costs are coming through. So there is a lot that we do to to mitigate that. I think the fact that we have a a network of 25 depots around the country means that we're more flexible and, and able to move our volume around to be as efficient as as we can be rather than just sort of trunking stuff out of a couple of big depots yeah, yeah we're, we're much closer to the customer so therefore our transport costs are probably a smaller percentage um, of our total costs compared to those that are doing more driving from from fewer distribution centers but we we work a lot with our customers on on how we can reduce the overall um bill basically the overall yeah. basket yeah. of costs because you know at the end of the day the distribution element of it is a small percentage of the cost of the food delivered so yeah. there's also the question about what are we doing about food cost how are we working with our customers to to give them menu inspiration different ideas suggest 
commodity switches or product switches to help them sort of mitigate those cost increases. But let's be realistic. Ultimately, it's going to work its way through into some level of inflation for the consumer because yeah, yeah. it has to. Before we move on the food costs, because that is a fundamental issue, um, but talking about the transport thing, because in a sense, you'll, you'll presumably have been hit by another supply chain issue in, in terms of transport, actually people building vehicles and lorries and stuff because of shortages of components. I mean, is that hitting you? Is that means you've got a bigger maintenance bill? Are you able to source new new vehicles? No, there, there has undoubtedly been a shortage of both new vehicles and components. So, yeah, as I say, we, we, we own our vehicles. We have about 1,200, which means we're, we're sort of replacing about 150 a year. And, you know, that would normally take six months from order to delivery, and that's now up to 12, sometimes even longer yeah. in terms of 12 months or longer, which ultimately means that over the next 12, 18 months, our our vehicle fleet will get a little bit older before before we're able to catch up, which means our repair bills will be higher. But the availability of spare parts, or indeed even the availability of mechanics to do the repairs, um, is 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 in a bad way because most of the mechanics are HGV qualified and have realised they can now earn <laughs> yeah, a very good living going back on the road. So, yeah, I'm not doing uh, I'm not doing woe is me because I know that every everybody in every part uh, of the business has has their own issues, but. Yeah, it is interesting. You know, the more you delve into it, um, you know, the, the harder it is. And when you go on to, you know, the availability of inbound food supply from our suppliers has been severely impacted due to the increased shipping costs. You know, the story of all the containers, the story, the fact of all the containers generally being in the wrong part of the world means it used to be, you know, fifteen hundred pounds or fifteen hundred dollars for a container from China, and now it could be. Ten thousand dollars for a container from China, and you know that that cost and that delay is 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 driving through in terms of inbound food supply um, standards and prices. Let's talk about food because that's a pretty fundamental thing, which it's, it's the heart of yeah. your business and 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 our listeners' businesses as well. Um, let's talk about f- food inflation. I mean, what are you seeing at the moment? What what where are the real pinch points in in, in cost increases in food? Last last six months, are, we we would say is the biggest cost increases we've seen on food for for over a decade. Um, some of it is. And, and, and it is, as, as people were saying, it's a, such a combination of factors. So some of it will be commodity driven, um, but some of it is um, shipping costs, um, like I was just talking about. Some of it is the manufacturer's costs because their um, wage bills are going up, their utility bills are going up, and all, all the things that are sitting everywhere else is going up for the manufacturers. Um, some of it is um, packaging costs, et cetera. And you know, it, and demand. So you know, the, as like I say, the the demand for certain categories and products has uh, has gone up, which has driven the price up. So certainly, we've seen in in all sectors, to be honest. Um, you know, as like I say, the largest increases that we've seen for for a decade. Our buying team are constantly working with suppliers to sort of push those increases back or reduce those increases. Um, but ultimately, some some of them or a lot of them will get will get forced through. Because obviously, even the last few weeks, we've seen um, you know queues of lorries again at the, the ports. I mean, how much is that? Is Brexit? How much is that? Is the, the, the shipping companies? I mean, what are what are the major major forces at work here? And and, and is is this a long term problem, or do you do you think it's is going to settle down in terms of um, not just pricing, but you know the availability of certain goods? I think the food inflation is definitely here for the next 12 months because I think um, if you look around Europe, we, we've got a number of, of bid food companies in Europe. You know, they're all seeing the same pattern as we are insofar as once you know, restrictions are lifted, you know, hospitality booms again. And you know, Europe is behind us in terms of lifting restrictions. So I think there's still going to be a swell of demand coming through from from Europe and, uh, and and America for for food products, and therefore I don't see that that inflation pressure is going to ease. Yeah, 
I think I'll be interested to see how the you know the the shipping um, impact eases or not because I think part of that was all just down to the overall labour market. So the delays we've seen in ports, etc., again was down to the you know, lack of HGV or forklift truck drivers, which hopefully may have uh, may have eased a little bit, but. There's certainly no no quick yeah. fix for this. So that's what we're saying to our customers is, you know, when you're looking at your your food cost and your menu engineering, you know, you this is you've got to assume it's going to be here for at least twelve months and and you know change things accordingly. Yeah, that's interesting because there's a lot of what you're saying is it's complex. A lot of forces that work here. It's not just one one thing. But but at the end of the day, there are there are problems, there are shortages. There's there, there's uh, pricing issues what are you seeing in terms of what operators are doing here within hospitality are are you seeing people changing where they source products from changing their menus and, and and to what extent i think we're certainly having a lot of conversations and and, and helping a lot of customers with, with the whole menu engineering piece and part of that is cost driven and part of that is um demand driven because obviously i'm sure we might talk about later the whole sort of you know environmental and sustainability agenda which is driving sort of some consumer trends and changes as well so you know if if swapping sort of a protein for a plant based product is is both you know good from attracting you know a different demographic and also reducing the cost then clearly that's of interest to people um looking at how one can you know, even just reduced protein levels or meat levels in replacement with uh, with pulses or vegetables, I think also is is things that people are looking at, and and the role that packaging plays. So, how can you use packaging and um, presentation to potentially you know command a bit of a premium to help you make up for some of the uh, the, the margin issues that you're facing? So, you know, obviously our our customers are the experts. They know they know their consumer, and they know they know their yeah. Their engineering as well, but it's certainly, I think, a, an area where we're having a lot of interesting discussions um, and around, you know, product switches, brand switches. Um, as you say, some country of origin changes, you know, the whole food security debate and, uh, you know, the, the buying more local, buying yeah. more British product um, debate. So, uh, yeah, there's so many moving parts. It's yeah. uh, it's an interesting discussion. Yeah, I mean, we're see, we're certainly seeing from all the sort of consumer research we're getting back is that it, undoubtedly there is a uh, a move to healthier uh, food. People are concerned about health, health, whether that was already there and accelerated perhaps by the pandemic. Um, people are concerned about provenance. All those things are coming in. I suppose it's probably getting a sense from you about you know it looks like a long term shift, but how how fast is, is is that shift? Because we're also seeing, I suppose, the debate around um, t- certainly the, the environmental impact of certain foods be getting more complex because I, I think there's a realisation that just because it's plant-based doesn't mean to say it, it's always green. And, and and meat production, particularly in Britain, may be green than it is in other, other parts of the world. How, how are you seeing those things play out? I mean, and how quickly are they, they playing out? I think well, and I suppose the other thing that we that we see is that just because it's plant based doesn't mean it's healthy. Yeah, there's a lot of yes. uh, <laughs> there's a lot of very tasty uh, plant based sort of fast food junk food out there, which is uh, you yeah, know again a great addition to the menu for the for the vegetarians, vegans, flexitarians, but doesn't necessarily mean healthy. And there are those competing demands. It's the plant based and also the the health and well being. I think one of the trends we picked up is you know the health is wealth trend insofar as you know it's it's good for the consumer and therefore it's good for the operator to uh, to be able to offer that i think what generally happens certainly from our perspective is that our product offering is usually quite a bit ahead of the consumer demand so i would probably say um you know the plant based vegan sort of vegetarian offering that we have probably makes up you know 10 to 15 percent of our products but it doesn't make up 10 to 15 percent of our demand uh and i think that's just the way that 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 it goes so we we have to offer for our customers you know a wide choice of of those sorts of products and i guess over the next uh, 12 months you know the the winning products and the winning brands and and whatever will will come through and there'll be some product rationalization on the back of it but uh 
it is yeah. certainly a key part of our offering. Because obviously at the moment for an operator, a lot of it is focused on the here and now, getting back open again, um, their people problems. But looking forward, I mean, two of the big trends around food is one is the government's policy, particularly in England, to um, funding, um, funding agriculture, moving away from EU type subsidies to um, you know, public money for public good, how that's playing out. Because I know you're, you're involved with, the, I think, still with the Food Farming and Countryside Commission. Uh, and also you've got, you know, Henry Dimbleby's food strategy. We'll know Henry is one of the founders of, of Leon, and, and I know you work close, closely with those. I mean, if people are moving, saying we want more British because, that one, it's the right thing to do, but, 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 but also, it, you know, it, 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 it may be more secure in terms of long-term uh, long-term supply. How have those changes, government-inspired changes, or, or or what Henry wants to do, is going to affect that? Do you think? Well, I think what we really need is is a proper uh, land use, stroke agriculture, stroke food strategy from the government, because all of those things that you've just mentioned are things that people are talking about, but they're probably in some cases, you know, conflicting um, things. Yeah. You know, Food, food security and British um, produced food, I think certainly at the beginning of the pandemic, that, that was very clear, wasn't it, in terms of when we saw the food shortages and people suddenly were questioning, well, where, you know, why, why are we having these shortages? Where is this food coming from? And there was a, quite a groundswell there for more um, British food. Whereas, yeah, on the face of it, some of the... Um, green initiatives which the government might be looking at for you know incentivizing farmers to to do more sort of um gr green initiatives on their farm may actually lead them to produce less you know it's, and and because they get more um benefit from a subsidy for for doing a green initiative than actually producing food so we yeah i think it's really important that you know the government gets a grip of it and gets a proper um, land use strategy and um, agriculture strategy because there's so much yeah you know, it's 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 a area of great interest and great passion and great emotion for everybody but um, it really can't be a case of whoever shouts loudest you know gets the result it's got to be what's what's the best thing for for, for the country and for the consumer in, are, in are the you optimistic about the future of farming and agriculture and food production in the uk <laughs> It's a tough but, question, but I suppose, and I probably landed point. that one on if, you, Andrew. If, if I was but, but, optimistic <laughs> that the government would indeed get a grip and, and get a strategy, because, you know, it, it's got to be all-encompassing. Yeah, we, we've yeah. been touting around these trade deals that we're doing with Australia and New Zealand, whoever else. And, you know, first question, what is, is it? why would it be possible to get, you know, lamb cheaper from New Zealand than uh, grown in the UK? But, but if it is, are we doing a trade deal that incentivizes that or, or discourages that? Yeah. And all, all those things have to be done in, in combination and in and in tandem and with with a degree of sort of sense and direction. So you know, you know, the capabilities of um, you know the, the the British agricultural sort of industry are massive. Yeah, you know, we are we are a massive food growing country. You know, it's yeah you know, hard to believe that we would get ourselves into a pickle, but yeah. we seem to manage to do it in uh, in quite a number of areas. Because the climate is quite good for it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, throwing something else in there, obviously, you know, towards the back end of last year, there's a massive focus on on climate change and green issues because UK um, hosted COP26. Um, do you see, are, are you feeling the impetus behind that is still there? Or, um, is government still pushing that forward? Do you, do you see your 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 company and, and, and your customers still pushing strongly uh in terms of becoming more um net zero um or or are other things sort of pushing that aside what's your sense no i think that that impetus is definitely there and yeah we reviewed sort of what were the key strategic priorities post pandemic and we thought that maybe you know the the focus on getting back up and running and getting back on 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 the straight and narrow would be a would be a priority but actually and therefore things like esg may take a bit of a a back seat but that's certainly not the case certainly as as you all know from the uh, peach 2020 conference you know that there's a lot of focus from from the from the from the operators yeah. in terms of 
those those net zero carbon um, commitments. And the, the 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 thing that caught my eye was that you know su- suppliers make up ninety percent of their scope three emissions. So you know there has to be that collaboration up and down the supply chain. And certainly from from our customer base, from the public sector side, it will become a prerequisite to even being able to enter a tender. You know you will have to have a net zero carbon commitment and demonstrable um, steps along the road to achieving it if you want to be tendering for you know NHS or, or other sort of public sector food supply. And from a you know profit sector, as it were, customer base, you know, that they are also making strong commitments because that's what their consumers want. And therefore we've got to be working um, alongside them to to help them deliver those. I think it's a, a massive challenge. And I think I said at the conference, you know, we really need some some good collaboration there because, um, you know, we, we recognise our contribution to to that uh, sort of emissions profile. Obviously, you know, with running twelve hundred trucks and operating twenty five or so big freezers around the country, we we do have you know a footprint which we need to reduce. Some of that's going to have to be driven by technology because. To be frank, electric vehicles aren't going to do it for us. Yeah. Um, for every one of our um, 18 tonners that delivers food to our customers, um, we'd need you know, nine or 10 electric vans. So you know, yeah, yeah. that's not actually going to work, work for us. Um, yeah, I think hydrogen fuel cells is, is, has a good potential. And obviously, there's, there's, develop, there's you know, experimentation and development in all of those areas that we're actively involved in. Um, yeah, solar, um, ground source heat pump, wind power, all of those things for our for our freezer and plant um, generation, um, and, and then also conversations with customers around how, yeah, you know, especially in some of those big city areas, you know, should we be looking at you know nighttime delivery, yeah. less congestion, you know, less emissions, easy, easier to operate, but obviously a, a whole host of uh, of knock on implications both for us and our customers. So. I, I do think, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I do think, yeah, the, the the forum that you created at Peach Twenty Twenty and, and other forums that where we're able to have those debates are the, are the right thing for us to be doing. Yeah, I mean, I think your your point's well made, isn't it? That sort of unintended consequences. People say, you know, we need we need uh, uh, less big trucks, but actually, big trucks can be quite efficient if they are they fueled the right way. Well, we would yeah. argue that we're doing our bit for the environment insofar as we're reducing, you know, 40 deliveries a week to three. Yeah, um, yeah. But obviously and, what uh, we want to do is those three three deliveries in a, in a more green um, and yeah, sustainable yeah. way. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a quote from, and I know you'll agree with this, actually, it's goes from one of your sustainability people, that uh, let's not allow perfection to stand in the way of progress. And I think it, it seems to me from the operator's point of view, it is a matter of we can wait, we need to measure, but actually... In a sense, the industry's got to start getting on with it uh, rather than uh, yeah, waiting for everything to be lined up. So, um, in terms of looking forward, in terms of those those bigger trends, we've you know we've covered a lot. You know, there's a lot of optimism, but obviously you're you're dealing with a lot of change there in in, in the market. How do you, how do you see the you know going down the track in a couple of years time? How do you see the future of hospitality? Do you do you see some new? What are the big trends you're you're looking for or expect to see in the next few years? Well, I think certainly if if, if you check out our website, you'll find our our, our <laughs> trends uh, trends publication on there. I think you know in, in terms of the food trends that we're seeing some of the, the key flavor trends coming through seem to be sort of peruvian filipino scandinavian and and, and british i think british is, is still going to feature very strongly i think the whole health and well-being and veganism trend is going to continue the flexitarian um offering i think there will be um wherever we end up post pandemic that that difference in terms of the Food to go, um, single use um, packaged food as opposed to less of the possibly some, you know, the sharing plates and the buffet type arrangements. So I think there's still quite a few things that we're looking at and saying you know, we're not quite sure where it's going to end um, post COVID. Are we going to, I think it'd be naive to think we're going to go back to exactly as things were before. Okay. Um, 
but conversely, I don't think things will be you know, as different as some people suggest. You know, I think to a certain extent we are we are creatures of habit, and as you say, you know, the, the, there will still be demand for you know traditional um, you know, steaks and, and meat and, and, and protein and all those things, as well as you know the the, the vegan and the, and the flexitarian offerings. And yeah, you know, I think it'd be interesting to see where we all end up back on the spectrum. Well, I think as we, we've seen, and you, and you certainly witnessed in terms of the demand for your services when, when um, hospitality reopened, the demand for the consumer is, is, is definitely there. I think the, the understanding is where they're, where they're going to be eating and drinking out. And I suppose a personal question, Andrew, I mean, when you go out without um, upsetting some of your customers, where, where, where's your ideal place to uh, go and relax? Uh, well, if, if, it, if it's just me, I'd be, I'd be heading to uh, somewhere very sushi based so you know like a if i was feeling very flush i'd go to a sexy fish or sushi samba but um if if i had the teenagers with me it'd be very much more nando's gbk and uh and the places that that, that they like and uh, and that i can afford when i take them but uh yeah we've got such an amazing range of 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 offerings such a great yeah breadth and, and expertise of operators you know you're never short no matter where you live, I don't think you're never short of, of great choices of places to eat. Indeed, uh, you're absolutely right. Now, going back to work, though, is there anything I missed up your massive board agenda? Um, anything else is, is worrying you, you're seeing down the track or, or, or something which uh, is likely to um, encourage you? I think for us, the other key thing we're focusing on is, is um, technology. I think, you know, if you, again, if you look um, one of the things that developed rapidly um, through the pandemic was was technology. So there's technology that we're using from a an operational point of view. Um, you know, we recognise that um, you know the chefs who we deliver to they don't live in a bubble whereby they're they're chefs. You know, at home they're getting their deliveries from Amazon and DPD and and all those other operators and and the sort of thing that sort of becomes standard over there insofar as the yeah, you know, the little text messages saying your delivery is three stops away, and your driver's called Marvin, and he likes you know such and such a music. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's sort of becomes what people expect, and so we're looking at, and, and we're, well, we we are implementing yeah you know, a lot a lot more technology in the whole you know paperless delivery, customer communication, um, vehicle routing side, and also from the from the e-commerce side, we we have our own sort of e-commerce. Um, business for the whole group worldwide and that develops e-commerce specifically for hospitality so you know bid food direct we've developed um you know menu um capabilities so customers can upload their menus and convert that into an order get all the allergen information um you know the ability to order just from a brochure so browse a brochure click on a product stick it into your basket um, you know, these are the areas where we're investing um, a lot of time and, and effort as well, because that's just that's what people expect now. And therefore, if you're not offering it, you're falling behind. So we want to make sure we're yeah, staying at the front. Well, Andrew Selly, thank you very much. Challenging but exciting time. So thank you for your time and uh, good luck with the rest of the year. No, thank you very much. The next episode of Top Table will be out in a couple of months' time, unless, of course, we are able to get a bonus episode or two out for you before then. This series of podcasts is sponsored by Bidfood, Fourth, Stint and Zonal. The Peach Podcast is always free to listen to. To find us, search Peach 2020 Top Table on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or on any app that supports podcasts. All of our podcasts will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. Now, don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe to make sure you don't miss our future episodes. Thank you. Podcast from Peach 2020, hosted by Peter Martin.